Now, his promise to get more into the Sixers, his observations after the Game 3 win is up right now over at 97.3 ESPN. A comment on 97.3 ESPN mobile app. He is Sixers beat writer Kevin McCormick joining us right now. Back on the boardwalk kind of hotline. I was telling the audience, Kevin, I wasn't sure if you were going to come back for a second straight day, but here you are anyway. How, uh, how long do you bail on me on this interview? Never. I could never bail. Come on. We, we already went through uh, a couple <laughs> weeks ago about my, my regimen for back-to-backs. I'm, I'm built for this. It's playoff season. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, obviously the Sixers, t- to me that was a definitive win last night because to me that was them saying, this is our series. And it doesn't matter if Danny Green had to leave with that calf strain, as they're calling it. We're going to go out here, and we're just going to put on a professional game. Nobody had a gaudy stat line. Nobody had any crazy, you know, stats, except for MB with the you know the high number of assists. I think he had eight assists last night. But to me, I thought the Sixers went out there and had a, had a professional win where they said, look, we're just the better team than you. I agree. It was in a very collective win, even all the way down to the second unit. When you look at, you know, Dwight Howard had arguably his best game of the playoffs in a Sixers uniform, maybe outside of game one against Washington. Furkan Korkmaz comes right in after Danny Green goes down and gives you 11 points. Matisse Thibel, I think, finished with seven points and a handful of steals. So I agree. There was nobody that really did anything too spectacular, but the entire team collectively played well. And it, it looked like it could be the kill shot of this series. If you look back towards the end of the game, they were panning to the Hawks bench. And I mean, those guys looked defeated. It really, it showed like in terms of their body language that they understood the mess that they have themselves in right now. And that maybe things are going to start going very South, very fast for them. When you think about it also, when it comes to the Hawks, you know, I think that the Sixers are proving what I've said a long, long, which is stars are going to score. They let Bradley Beal score in the first round. They're letting Trey Young score in the second round. But they're saying, we're not going to let you elevate the other guys to beat us. You know, hey, you want to throw a couple of lob passes? We'll take that over three-pointers. And so far, 17 threes in games two and three combined after allowing 20 in the first game. It seems like the Sixers are saying, we're not letting you beat us there again. And the Hawks are having trouble adjusting. Exactly. And that's all it comes down to in the superstar-driven league. You know the Bradley Beals, the Trey Youngs, you know, guys of that caliber, they're going to get theirs just because of simply how magnificent they are at the sport. Like you said, the key is slowing down the the Kevin Herters, the Bogdan Bogdanoviches, the Danilo Gallinari's because it's when the role players get hot that a game can swing. And if you go back to game one, that was obviously the case. Although Bogdanovich did play rather well last night. I'll give him credit. He's actually played well throughout this entire series. I've been somewhat impressed from him, but – when you're letting all those shooters get hot, and you, if you look at game one compared to games two and three now, it just shows the increased intensity of the, the Sixers' defense. In game one, they were just letting guys step into wide-open threes. There was poor rotations, you know, and it was just endless wide-open shots for Atlanta. While in games two and three, they're chasing all, a lot more. They're rotating a lot better. They're making the Hawks take contested threes. They're making them put the ball on the deck instead of just having those nice catch-and-shoot opportunities. So I agree. I mean – the key is with teams like this, you'll let the superstar go and get whatever theirs is, but you don't want to let them get the bench players hot and the role players and the secondary, you know, supporting players hot because that's when they get put in a position to where they could potentially steal a game once all those hot hands get going. Do we read anything into the fact that the Sixers have now beaten the Hawks by a total of 16 points in each game? Game two at home by 16, game three by 16. Do we read anything into that, or is that just kind of like how the game played out? Read into it in terms of what? The Sixers just clearly being the better team? Yeah, and the fact that, like, you know, when you win by double digits, that's kind of a statement. It's kind of like telling the other team, hey, we we didn't just win. We, like, we won this game. It wasn't in question at the end. I will say both wins have been in more than rather convincing fashion. It's clear they have no answer for MB. Tobias Harris continues to play phenomenal. Seth Curry, too, has been incredible. I can't believe, uh, even at points in Game 3, it blows my mind that Atlanta is still letting him get wide-open shots. But, I mean, when I came on with you last night, you know, we talked about the series being 50-50, and I said that that really wasn't the case, that it was more 60-40, 70-30 in, ter- in favor of the Sixers. And I think that's just showing now. I mean, the Sixers are the one seed for a reason. I don't know why after game one everyone 
wanted to go run into panic mode. Even the national media was trying to create that this series was, you know, supposedly neck and neck. This is a young Atlanta team. They have little experience, and they're going up against a Sixers team who have been focused all year on hunting for a championship. Joel Embiid continues to raise his game to new heights. And I think just that experience factor and that focus and that intensity of the playoffs is starting to show now because Atlanta threw their best punch in game one, and the Sixers now have come back two consecutive games and hit them hard, and Atlanta hasn't been able to respond. And I think that's just the the doubt is starting to set in with them and them understanding that, you know, this team is clearly superior and they're not going to give an inch. Kevin McCormick joining us here on Sports Bash Saturday here on 97.3 ESPN at Kevin MCC NBA on Twitter. Check out his observations after the Sixers win right now at 97.3 ESPN.com. And Kevin, one of your observations was about Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons, his assists plus points output accounted for 34 points. And so it's 34 of the Sixers points last night were just from Ben Simmons alone. It seems like as the playoffs have progressed, either people want to focus a lot on his scoring, the fact that he's stopping points on the other end, and he's facilitating points on the offensive end, it seems like he has really found his kind of like his uh, his niche at this point. Absolutely. It's always been his niche, but people just haven't been able to accept it. I I don't understand how after game two people were all up in arms about Ben Simmons only attempting three shots when Joel Embiid was going for 40 points and Seth Curry was barely even hitting the net on all his jump shots. What's so great about a superstar like Ben Simmons is he is more than okay with stepping back when other guys are the hot hand, whether it's Seth Curry, whether it's Joel Embiid, whether it's Tobias Harris. He doesn't really care. He's not a guy that needs to go out there and get his All that really matters to him is winning in the end, and he understands that his ability to impact winning is with his elite-level defense, with his elite-level facilitation. But credit to him. I don't know what was said to him at halftime. You know, Some of the guys gave a little bit of insight of what was talked about with Ben Simmons at the halftime of Game 3, but it worked. He completely went into attack mode in the second half, attacking mismatches, using him in the post, just getting downhill, but... Yeah, I mean, his niche is being that Swiss Army Knife guy, and then when the moment arises, he's been able to take advantage of it. I think the second half of Game 3 draws a lot of resemblance to Game 2 against Washington, where Joel Embiid realized that the Wizards were not going to leave his side. They were pretty much going to throw the kitchen sink at him all game, and Embiid said, all right, that's fine. Come follow me out to the perimeter and completely opened up the lane for Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris to attack, and Ben took complete advantage of it. So I think it's just more Ben is very good at picking his spots, and the Sixers are just, they're tough to compete with. I mean, it's just, it's simple as that. Yeah, and I'm not one of the people who likes to throw around words like generational talent or transcendent, you know, with almost anybody. Not because I'm anti-Ben Simmons, but because I just don't like the, I feel like the term is overused at this point. But here's my thing. And I'm going to draw you into this conversation. You know, Mike, you had this conversation a little bit earlier this week. I feel like the number one overall pick narrative is such a, such an overrated thing. Because you go through the number one overall picks over the last 20 plus years, outside of LeBron and Dwight Howard, there's no number one overall pick that elevated their team to be an NBA Finals contender. You have all these busts like Kwame Brown, Guys like Greg Oden couldn't stay healthy. Anthony Davis couldn't barely get out of the first round with the Pelicans. He had to go join LeBron to actually go anywhere. There's a lot of these, excuse me, there's a lot of these number one overall picks. They're talented players if they stay healthy. But, Kevin, they're really not that good. So, realistically, Ben Simmons is actually on par with the number one overall pick narrative, which is as long as you're better than Greg Oden, Markel Fultz, and Kwame Brown – it's a successful pick at this point. And it's not like he doesn't contribute to winning. Like at, at the end of the day, if the Sixers do end up winning a championship with, you know, Joel Embiid leading the charge on the offensive end and Ben Simmons being the guy who's just locking up the opposing team's best player and is setting the table for everyone, if that gets you a title, I would say that's a successful number one pick. We are talking multi-time all-star all NBA caliber player is always near the top of the league in assists is now, you know, regarded as the most versatile defender in the NBA should have been the defensive player of the year this year. will likely win the award multiple times before he hangs it up. So, I mean, 
that's a successful resume for a number one pick. I think it's just people are so caught up in the the offensive highlight, you know, culture of today's game that a guy like Ben Simmons is so against the grain that you think of just because how different he is that that translates to him being bad. But I mean, there's more than one way to impact winning basketball outside of scoring and pulling out from the logo. Yeah, let's 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 do a, a, a bit of a futile exercise, but an opportunity to educate people out there listening. Josh Hennick here on Sports Bash Saturday on 97.3 ESPN, joined by Kevin McCormick. You can see him live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. We we're also live on 97.3 ESPN FM and 97.3 ESPN mobile app. So I, I'm going to go back 22 years, okay, Kevin? And that way we can kind of like give the audience an idea of what we're talking about. So because before 22 years ago, basketball evaluation was different, okay? Mm-hmm. Basketball evaluation in the modern era or the Jordan era, okay, all the guys who grew up watching Magic and Bird and Jordan, it's a different world. So here's your number one overall picks. Michael Olawa Candy. He's a bust, right? We all agree on that. Never even heard of him, to be honest. Oh, my God. Go, when you get a chance, go back and look at the 98 draft. That was the year the Sixers took Larry Hughes over Paul Pierce, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, Elton Brand was drafted the next year. Solid all-star, but was never some transcendent, franchise-changing player. Phenomenal executive. Phenomenal, right. <laughs> uh, Kenya Martin was drafted the next year. A great highlight film, real great blocks. But he was like the third option on the Nets team that got to the NBA Finals. Yeah, he's kind of like in that, that Ben Simmons category of like, you know, just a physical guy who... Wasn't really like, like you said, the top of offensive go to guys, but was still a solid piece on some good teams. Uh, Kwame Brown was a bust. We all agree on that. Uh, Yao Ming, when he was healthy, was an impactful player, but the Rockets never got to an NBA Finals with him. They never even, they didn't really do much with him, and he was injured more often than not at one point, and it pretty much derailed his career with all the foot injuries. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really put a put like a, a marker on that just because like you said, the, the injuries are what really derailed him. I mean, when he was healthy, it, he was a dominant player. If he stays healthy, I think he more than lives up to that number one pick stature. And it's ironic because if you, if you look at his stats during his career for as big and as impactful as he was when he was healthy Embiid actually still has better, some better stats than him in terms of some of the rebounding and the offensive metrics the only thing that Yao was better at than MB was he had probably like a higher block volume. That's because Yao was like seven eight, so that kind of helps a little bit. Uh, LeBron James, we know who he is. Uh, Dwight Howard led the Magic to an NBA final, so we got to give him that. I agree, and still phenomenal backup center. Absolutely, uh, Andrew Bogut bust. Andre Bargnani, that was a Brian Colangelo pick up there in Toronto. He was a bust. Greg Oden. A billion injuries. He never worked out. By the way, the guy drafted number two in that year was Kevin Durant. So yeah, actually, that, the the number two pick ended up being a hundred times better than the number one overall pick. <laughs> it, I still can't believe, even in the moment, it still blows my mind that Kevin Durant wasn't taking it like the first pick. I don't know what Portland saw in Odin that they I'll, loved. It so I'll tell much. you what they saw. They saw that Kevin. They thought Kevin Durant was too skinny. That was the whole conversation. I remember that whole draft. The whole ramp up was. Durant's too skinny. Can he stay healthy? You're choosing between the guy who's been injured and the guy who could get injured. So you're picking the evil that you know, you know, all that kind of stuff, and end up blowing up Portland's face again. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, they could have had a six eleven guy who can play like a guard and shoot over just about anybody in the league. I mean, can you imagine a team that at that time would have Kevin Durant and uh, Brandon Roy? Or it later would have been Kevin Durant and Damian Lillard. I mean, good grief. Yeah, it would have been scary. Brandon Roy, if he stayed healthy and you put him with Kevin Durant, Brandon Roy was one of my favorite players when I was first growing up in my NBA fandom, and it still breaks my heart that injuries derailed his career. But if you put him and Kevin Durant together when they're healthy, that would have been a scary, scary offense. Absolutely. Uh, who else we got here? Blake Griffin. Uh, Blake Griffin is a nice player. All-star, good player, but he wasn't a franchise-changing player. The Clippers didn't do anything until Chris Paul got there. Not to mention Steph Curry and James Harden went picks later. That's true as well. Uh, Derrick Rose won the league MVP. 
He was great player until he got injured. The injuries went derailed him, but for that short window of a few years, he turned that Bulls team into a perennial contender. Yeah, if he doesn't go down, he most certainly lives up to that stature. You need to forget, you can't forget, he took that Miami Heat team to seven. Like he took them the distance, putting Chicago pretty much just on his shoulders. Like you said, youngest league MVP in history was on his way to paving, you know, the next phase of the point guard position. So if he doesn't get hurt, he definitely lives up to that number one pick stature. Uh, John Wall. John Wall is a good player, all star, but he was never able to elevate the Wizards beyond a certain point, and then the injuries caught up to him. So it's kind of a similar narrative, but like a lesser version than Rose. Uh, Kyrie Irving never won without LeBron James. We're still waiting for him to win without LeBron James. He was on the Cavs, and they were they were a lottery team. Yeah, but he's still a phenomenal player. That, that's a trend again, I, that, that you take but, at number one. Though. But again, I'm not saying he's a bad player. I'm just saying that he's not a game changer. Like, you take LeBron James, Kevin Durant, you put them on any team in the league, they're a contender. You don't do that with Kyrie Irving. You don't do that with John Wall, Blake Griffin, and these other guys. I agree. Part of it also goes down to, you know, the, the talent that's around them, too. Some of these guys, although sure, they but, were great players, their situation around them never essentially improved. But, Kevin, LeBron James, at, what, 23 years old, drug the band of misfit toy, toys, Cavs, to the NBA Finals they lost to the Spurs. Like, that's what I'm talking about here. Like, people want the number one overall pick. The number one overall pick every year is LeBron James. But more often than not, you're getting John Wall and Kyrie Irving. You're not getting LeBron James. I mean, it's tough to compare anyone to LeBron James. The dude's going to go down as arguably the first or second best player ever. Well, on my list, he's third, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, Anthony Davis talked about him. We all agree Anthony Bennett was a bust, right? Yeah, absolutely. If, you ever, if anyone gets a chance, check out Bobby Marks' story about the Anthony Bennett 2013 draft because he was working for the Nets at the time. His story about the number one overall pick that year is absolutely mind-blowing about why it became Anthony Bennett. It's an amazing story. I can't do it justice to explain it here, but if you get a chance, look up the story by Bobby Marks. Uh, Andrew Wiggins, the pick next year, good player, maybe all-star caliber, but same draft with Joel Embiid. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns, all-star, good player, not changing the franchise. Then you get Ben Simmons. So, realistically, in the last 22 years, and in all the years for Ben Simmons, there were three guys who changed their franchise. Everyone else was either a bust, injury-prone, or just a solid, good all-star. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? I, some of them, like I said, I think uh, situation definitely plays a part in that. But, like you, I mean, I agree with you. There's very few number one overall. There's very few high picks in general that come in and just completely transcend a franchise just because there's very few players in history who have had the all around capability to do that. So, I mean, part of what helps these high picks elevate their game and and reach that contender status is how is the team able to respond after that once they get that talent in house? Yeah. And listen, I understand there's a contingent of people out there who are all feeding into the Kwame Brown vomit. That he's been putting out there. You know, we got one comment on here, you know, still calling people a bust. Hashtag mom is cooking. Look, I get it. The Kwame Brown uh, truthers are buying into the Kwame Brown vomit. But go back and watch Kwame Brown. You'll actually know for yourself who, who and what Kwame Brown was. He should have never entered the draft. He should have gone to college. They drafted him out of high school. They were convinced he could be something that he wasn't. And guess what? He is a bust. I'm not going to back off of that. Still a legend on Instagram. There's a lot of people who are legends on Instagram, okay? There are people who are literally only famous because of Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. If it wasn't for those three platforms, nobody knows who half these people are. So I don't give them credit for that, okay? If I wanted to be crazy and had about 20 hours in my day to do a lot of nothing, I could be famous in, in social media too. But actually, I work a real job. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Kevin's just baffled at this point. <laughs> Kevin McCormick. I didn't, I, I didn't expect ahead. to come on and spend this much time talking about Kwame Brown. I didn't either, but you know, the Ben Simmons people made me do it. So 
It's like when the, the people say the devil made me do it. The, quant, the Ben Simmons haters made me do it. There you go. <laughs> Kevin McCormick at Kevin MCC NBA on Twitter. Uh, before I let you go, uh, game four is on Monday night. The Bucks Nets are tomorrow afternoon. Which series ends first? Sixers Hawks. So you have the Sixers Hawks ending in five. I think it could. I actually I don't know if it's more. I think the Sixers are going to win in five. I still have this little bit of faith that Milwaukee is going to pull something out and extend the series, and the series is eventually going to live up to the hype. Okay. All right. Well, so far it's only been one game for each team that's been impressive, really. And then yeah, that. I one mean, I, is the Bucks win even impressive? It, I, you're right. Maybe no, it's not that impressive. That game was hard. That game yeah. was hard. It, it was bad. I'll give you that. I mean, yeah. Uh, it was ugly. For ha, ha, First of all, how do you win and lose a game in back-to-back games and score almost the exact same points? Like, that in and of itself is, like, mind-boggling. The Bucks literally won one game after losing the game before and scored, like, almost the exact same number of points. I'm still just asking myself, who does Bruce Brown think he is that he's taking final shots over Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving <laughs> when they're both just standing next to him? Like, how are they not ready to just rip this man alive in the huddle after the game? Like, well, because they need him. He's the only guy healthy. Yeah. <laughs> next, they'll be relying on uh, TLC. Well, they're already re- they're already relying on Mike James. I mean, Mike James is putting in yeoman's work for a couple games there. True, but I mean, I guess it's easy to. Do all that when you have all that just stack star talent. But go Milwaukee. Need them to tear <laughs> each other apart. At Kevin MCC NBA on Twitter for all his Sixers and NBA coverage, his observations after the Sixers game win last night over at 973 ESPN.com. And as all guests, Kevin appeared on the Boardwalk on a Hotline in virtual living color on Facebook, <laughs> YouTube, and Twitter with the classic Adidas hat. I'm liking that hat, man. I told you that earlier. <laughs> Thanks. Kevin, have a good one, man. Take care of yourself. Thanks, man. You too.